Lift your hands to the Lord with me this morning. Father, we lift ourselves to you. I humble myself under your mighty hand. I pray, Lord, that you would, you would use me this morning as your vessel to speak your word. I submit myself wholly to your will, wholly to the Holy Spirit this morning, that, Lord, that not out of my natural mind, my natural thought, but out of the Spirit of the Lord, you may speak. And I pray that you would bless the hearers today, that all of us would be enriched and empowered, equipped by the word of the Lord to do your will more perfectly. In Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord is good. We're going to, if you want to open your Bible, we're going to be reading in a few moments from Exodus chapter 12. As we come into the time of understanding and getting into a greater revelation of what Passover means to us, I think, first of all, it means significant to all of us, don't you? Because not do we look at this just as an observance of an Old Testament memorial, but we understand the principle of the New Testament application through Jesus Christ to us. But it's good to look and see some new insights. I hope that this morning the Lord would open some new doors to us concerning what Passover really means to each one of us, individually and corporately. You know, in the Passover, I see transference, I see substitution, I see appropriation, I see immunity, and, and I see a dedication of the Lord to bless you with everything that pertains to life and godliness. The goodness of God is so revealed in Passover because it's showing us and demonstrating to us the heart of God towards humanity. We, we understand the basic premise of why we're here this morning is that God just loved us like crazy. Everybody say, the Lord loves me like crazy. We often say, I love you like crazy. Well, the reason we can say, I love you like crazy is because God first loved us and gave his life for us. If, if I can receive that much love imputed to me by him, or given to me by the Lord, then it makes it a no-brainer to give that same love back to you. If God loved me, then I should also love you. Because if, if I haven't received God's love, then the ability to love you, I'm incapable of that. But the more I receive of that grace, the more I understand the power of the forgiveness of the Lord, it makes it so much easier than for me also to extend grace to you, to extend forgiveness to you. All that judgment that he went through, all that pain that he went through made a pathway so that we could extend his nature to others. So in the story of Israel coming out of, of Egypt, we find such an interesting... In fact, the first time I ever understood this at all was when I was a child and watched the Ten Commandments. How many ever watched the Ten Commandments? I love the Ten Commandments. Charlton Heston was ordained by God to play that part, don't you think? And uh, I love that part when he's up on the mountain and out of the fire said, I am that I am. Wow. <laughs> you are, Lord. You sure are. I am that I am. And Charlton Heston played a great role as Moses in the story of the, the, the Exodus, the, the freedom that they escaped Came, coming out of Egypt. The beautiful part about this great escape or this great deliverance what is it was so complete that not only did they get free from the oppressor, the free from the bondage. How many of you know that's the prerequisite? First prerequisite is the freedom from the thing that locks you in. How many know that in life there's a lot of things that lock us in that we need to be free from? You know, Christ, in the New Testament, Christ has come to set you free. And if you be free, then be free indeed. In other words, all the chains that are binding you, let them be broken in the name of the Lord. Let everything be released out of your life that's holding back and hindering 
the thing that God has set before you. Because when they were released from Egypt, not only did they escape out of their personal bondage, but they also escaped as a wealthy people. God not only freed them from their bondage 430 years, but he gave them in the midst of that an incredible wealth. Now, we might not look upon them as wealthy, but they were very wealthy because not only were they able to take everything with them that they had, they were also were able to take the spoils of Egypt with them as well. Isn't that just like God? God said, I'm going to set you free, but I'm going to set you free indeed. I'm going to bring you into an abundance out of the midst of your greatest bondage. And I've learned in life that it's out of my greatest failure, my greatest trial, my greatest personal disappointment, that when I turn to the Lord, not only does he liberate me from that, but he gives me something so great. It's like the prodigal son when he came back. He would lost everything, wasted it away. But when he came back, the Lord said, kill the fatted calf for him. So it's in that turning to the Lord that all of us have an opportunity that any moment of our life, any time in our life, we have an opportunity to turn back to the Lord. And the moment we do, we not only are free, but we're empowered with a blessing that comes from God. It talks about the eye have not seen nor the ear heard nor entered the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. I want to challenge you this morning. Just test the Lord. Just see if he will give you something that you could not even anticipate if you'll turn to him. But, you know, the human nature is the very last thing we do is usually turn to the Lord because we try to find all kinds of remedies. We try to find all kinds of things that will, that will satisfy us until sometimes we have to come to the very end of our rope before we'll finally say, I will call upon the Lord. The minute you call upon him, he will answer you. Well, they've been crying out to God for 430 years. I have a feeling that it was closer to the 430th year that they really cried. Lord, send us a deliverer. Send someone to free us from the oppression and the pain and the death and the humiliation that we're enduring under the hands of the taskmaster. The Lord said, I'm going to send you a Savior. His name was Moses. He will deliver his people from their bondage. So Moses came to bring a great liberty and sufficiency of the presence of the Lord. In chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, Every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And in the household is, if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. We have to understand in the Old Testament there was a lot of blood shed. Not only was this initial Passover the shedding of all these lambs. You see there were 600,000 men that came out of Egypt. This isn't counting the women and the children. So well over a million probably a million and a half, two million people actually came out. So you had at least 600,000 households. So at least 600,000 lambs were all slain in exactly the same moment at the same time. And that blood that was shed out of the lamb was drained, and they took it, and they took it, and they placed it on the doorpost because Moses had declared to Pharaoh that if you don't let my people free, there's going to be a judgment that comes. And all the firstborn of not only Pharaoh's house, 
but all of Egypt's house and even of the Israelis' house if they don't put this blood over the doorpost. So when the judgment came, every house that did not have the blood, the firstborn died. The judgment came. It took that final judgment in order for there to be a final freedom for the people of God. See, judgment always perceives the liberty that God gives us. There's always a judgment before there's ever a salvation. So the Lord demonstrated to them that when you take this lamb, this one-year-old lamb, and you slaughter it, you not only drain the blood, you put the blood over the doorpost, but then you take the lamb, even the very entrails of the lamb, and you roast it. You don't boil it, but you roast it. By the way, who would re I'd much rather have roasted lamb than boiled lamb, right? You roast the lamb, and then you take and you eat every part of it. Now, if your lamb is bigger than your household, then bring other people into the household so that to make sure that all of the lamb is eaten. Because it's important that you, that you not only shed the blood of the lamb, but that you eat all of the lamb. Of course, we relate that to Christ, don't we? Because when he came on this Passover of the kingdom, he said, this is my blood that was shed for you. We know that by the, by, by the edict of the Lord that without the, the remission, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission or covering or forgiveness of sin. So when Christ came as our Passover, he came shedding his blood, but also giving his body. For he said in the Last Supper, he said, this is my body, take this and eat. When you bring the bread, take and eat this bread, take and eat all of it. Because by the proportion of how you, re that you consume it becomes the proportion by which, how you're strengthened by God. See, when we're anemic, it means we haven't eaten enough or the right things, right? We don't have enough iron in the blood. And a lot of Christians find themselves anemic. They have just enough of the Lord to kind of eke by, kind of just make it. But God does not want any anemics in his kingdom. He wants you to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And the only way that can happen is by the consumption of who he is, by the heart's cry that says, I've got to have all of him. I've got to have everything that God has. I've got to press in to the very limits to ex find this knowledge of God within my life because this becomes my strength. The Lord is my strength. He is my refuge. He is my rock. He is my high tower. He has everything to me. Take eat all of him. That's why we need to be hungry. You know, most people don't eat without being hungry, right? Some of us, maybe. But most people don't eat until they get hungry. And a lot of people in the body of Christ need to cry out, Lord, make me hungry again. Make me desire you again. Because without him, apart from him, we, our lives accomplish little. But with him, we become everything he's called us to be. Amen? You like it? Good. Me too. What verse did we stop on? Okay, verse 8. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with butter, bitter herbs they shall eat it. Now, the bitter herbs is remembering. See, we always need to remember the pit from which we've been dug. Just when you think it's bad for you as a Christian, how many walk as a Christian here, everybody, I hope, and you, you go through some struggles that sometimes it seems very bad. But just remember what it was like before. No matter what you're going through as a Christian, doesn't compare to what you went through without Christ. Amen? Sometimes they go, oh, this is so hard walking with God and putting up with the people and the people putting up with me and all this stuff. But guess what? It was a lot worse before him. Amen? So i got to keep remembering how just, see, the bitter herbs, you take just a little taste of what it was like. Think about it. when you're, with, when you're give, taking the communion or every day that you wake up, 
and you're going through some things, just remind yourself just a little bit, not a whole lot, don't think about it too much, but remind yourself what it was like before you knew him. And just think about what it's like now that you do know him. Not only maybe what it's like for you right now, but what it could be like for you right now if you just partake of him. Wow. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm. I went the other day to this barbecue place. Uh, I've been there before. It's called Black's. It's what, and Travis and I went. You don't mind me telling Travis said, let me order this for us. And so he ordered a beef rib. He said, now cut us a beef rib out of the middle. In other words, I want the beefiest, juiciest beef rib that you have. And so the guy cuts this big, huge beef rib, gives it to us. One beef rib. Some people say, is one rib enough? Uh-huh, that one is. Well, wow. Wow. We ate every bit of it. We ate it. We even ate the cartilage. I mean, that bone was stripped. And if he hadn't been looking at me and I hadn't been looking at him, we'd probably eaten the bone too. See, that's the hunger that God wants us to have. Take and eat all of him. Because there's something that's imparted to us in that that we cannot substitute for, that you can't find anywhere else. Believe me, I've looked everywhere I could look to find it, but I couldn't find it until I found him. In him I live and move and breathe and have my being. There's nothing else that really satisfies you. I might perk you up for a season, but until you eat the meat until you desire the meat of the word and the meat of the word isn't some fancy hocus pocus revelation that you get and no one else gets it's the meat of the word is that simple that the great knowledge of knowing the Lord wow don't let any of it remain until morning verse 11 thus shall you eat it with a belt on your waist Wow, your sandals on your feet, staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste, for it's the Lord Passover. What the Lord is saying, when you really get down to it and you really press in and you really grab a hold of this, then get ready. Something great is about to happen in your life. That's when in a moment of a twinkling of an eye, everything changes the moment you encounter him. Say, well, I, nothing's happening for me. Well, what's the problem? Why isn't it? I don't know. Well, it's because you haven't taken a seat at the table. You're not eating the lamb. I guarantee you, when you get encounter the Lord, something happens in you. Well, I'm just so depressed. I'm so upset. I'm so discouraged. It's just been going on now for years. Well, get out of it. Eat. Eat, eat the Lord, and you're going to find all of a sudden, get ready because you're going, to be, you're going to be catapulted right out of that place of bondage. Wow. Get ready. Now, what happened when they got out of Egypt? Where did they go? The wilderness. Well, before you feel too sorry for them, think about it. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. And I've been to the wilderness recently. I know what the wilderness looks like. It's a wilderness. <laughs> I mean, if you think we live in a wilderness here, you ought to go see that wilderness. It looks worse than any wilderness I've seen in Arizona. And a lot of wilderness out there, right? But it's worse. It's a wilderness. And when you get in the wilderness and your shoes don't wear out, your clothes don't wear out, and you get food every morning, you get a cloud every day, and you get a fire every night, do you call that poverty? No. Every need was met, even in the wilderness. But the wilderness wasn't the final destination, was it? 
But it was a destination because the wilderness experience is always mandated for every one of us. Because it's only in the wilderness that we learn what it's like to be obedient and to be committed. God doesn't take you just right into all the fullness and the manifestation of the fullness until you first go through the process of the wilderness because that's where you learn the ways of the Lord. Now, I challenge any of you here, if any of you could prove to me that you haven't passed through some kind of wilderness that you've accepted Christ. But does that mean that I'm happy that we're have been in the wilderness? No. Is that, am I content to live there? No way. Jose, I have no desire to be in the wilderness. My only cry is to be in the land that's flowing with milk and honey. Now, because, see, it's in the wilderness so that we learn something. We learn what responsibility is all about so that when we do cross the river, we will become responsible for the place that God propelled us to become. See, the church, this, the church doesn't exist for you just to dwell in it and have your needs met. The church exists for you to use this as a pass-through to become a son of God, to become a triumphant one. That's what the church is for. The church is simply the incubator that's creating a people that become the kingdom of God. The wilderness is simply an incubator that lets us pass through. Some quicker than others, some not at all. But hopefully all of us will enter in. All of us left when Christ came. Now let us all enter in to the fullness of his grace and his glory. This grace that comes upon grace, grace that's piled upon grace upon grace upon grace, that's magnified and released to all his people, let us be a partakers of that divine nature that God gives us. Wow. Man. Oh. Whew. Man. Passover frees us from the oppressor. I've already covered that. I like it when I'm, I'm already preached ahead of my notes. So for the sake of brevity, I won't repeat those things. Just because they're there doesn't mean I'm going to say them. But one of the things I wrote down, the immunity that God gives us in the time of crisis. We know that, that we're in the midst right now of a change of ages. How many believe that? That this is a dispensation of change. This is the dawning of something new happening in the body of Christ in this hour. It's, it's maybe not just this year or last year or the last 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 years, but, it, but it, we're right in the middle of this great change that God's taking us through. Now, it might be that, that we see the fulfillment of it in our lifetimes, but it might be that we don't. But we do know this one thing, change is here. And God is transforming us in the midst of this change. He, we're coming through this place of crises. You see, every time a change comes to your life, it also denotes that you're in a time of crises. Because change is the most difficult thing for any of us to accept. Change is not something we readily embrace because it always requires the loss of something. Because every time we change, we have to give up something that we've held on to in order to become something that greater than what, to what we're to be. How many know that God always has something greater in store for you? Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad that, that this is not all you get? I mean, as great as this is, this isn't the final completion. There's something greater coming for you. Everybody, are you happy? Say, I'm happy about that. That greater things have coming. I have not seen nor you heard what God has prepared for them that love him. So God is always setting before us in the midst of this Passover, the midst of this, this travailing that we go through, that there's something greater fixing to take place in you. And because of the transference 
that God gives us. See, the Israelis transferred all their need and all their guilt in the hour of judgment to this little innocent lamb. Why would we kill an innocent lamb? We bless Clinton, by the way. He's going to be uh, leading a deal on the campus next week for Easter, right? We bless you, we empower you in the presence of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Glad I was reminded of that. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, in the hour of judgment, we transfer everything to this little innocent lamb that became a substitute. It's amazing how God chooses the most humble representation in all of creation to be the one that has to take the brunt of the judgment. The lamb. I mean, why not let's go kill some lion. Let's go kill some mighty beast and transfer all of our guilt and sin to him. Why do we take some little innocent lamb and transfer all of our sin? Wow. In the book of Isaiah, it said, The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He took this human, this Christ transferred every bit of our iniquity to him. There's something about this image of the cross that we should never lose of what it means to us. That there's one that hung there that took everything that we are to himself. All of our iniquities were transferred to him. And we know the spirit, what it feels like to have this marvelous release of this burden of sin. How many have ever felt burdened by sin? How many have ever felt, though, the great release that comes when the burden bearer takes all of your sin to bear? He bore all of our sin. Man, I can walk through life free from all guilt, association of guilt, condemnation of guilt, I could be free because a lamb hung on a cross for you and me. So the children of Israel took this little lamb. Don't you know it was kind of a sad thing at that time because probably they brought this lamb into their home sometime before this. It had this lamb they'd been raising. The little lambs are cute, right? They really are. And the children probably, the little kids in the house probably, oh, and our little pet lamb, you know, laid down with the lamb, sleep with the lamb, play with the lamb. Then all of a sudden the father says, we're going to have to slay the lamb. Because as great as this lamb is, and beautiful as he is, there's some, a greater purpose that he serves. He is our salvation. And as great as Christ was upon the earth, magnificent in the glory of the transfiguration, this great healer, teacher, rabbi, this wonderful expression of what, how great humanity could be if it walked in righteousness, became the lamb that we transferred our sin to that we marred his countenance with the whip and with the cross to give us our freedom. Thank God for the transference. Thank God for this identification, this principle of identification. When we identified as they identified with the lamb, when we identify so fully with Christ, God is bringing forth out of us in this hour. The principle of identification is such the key to our deliverance. It's the key to everything that we're going to hold fast in the days to come. For when I'm identified with Christ, it means that his experiences become my experiences. And everything that he was, I become as well. 
And we as a people come before the Lord, as Paul did, and said that I am crucified with Christ. We identify with this crucified Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, when I, when I see that, when I become identified with him, I don't have to fight a battle anymore. I don't have to be struggling anymore. For now I've entered into this absolute victory that he won at the cross. Now I can say, O grave, where is thy victory? Death, where is thy sting? Because no longer does it apply to me because I have identified with the one who took it all away, who overcame the wicked one, who destroyed the works of the devil. So now, no longer now do I wrestle and fight against flesh and blood. No longer do I have to contend with the things of this old nature because Christ has won that victory over my nature. And I have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of my identification with him. I know that sounds great in theory, but you know it's actually becoming ours in practice. This great confidence and boldness that comes to us because we've identified with the one who won the victory. How many love the winner? We all love the winner, don't we? Man, and he is the ultimate winner. He is the ultimate victor, even though it appeared that he, everything was lost when this lamb died. Who knew that this lamb would become a lion? Who knew that this buried one would become a resurrected one? Next week's April the 1st, April Fool. He's not in the grave. He's risen, right? Hallelujah. How many love this particular week every year when we think about this great process of sacrifice, of death, but also the resurrection? We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the high places. Man, it's like dripping down every blessing that flows from the throne of God. I've got a saying. There shall be showers of blessings, showers of blessings we see. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we pray. But for the showers we plead. However, but that's in my heart. You know, I, last night in my dream, I was singing the song. It was the most beautiful song. And it was an original. And I got up at 2.30 in the morning to write it down. And before I could write it down, I forgot it. <laughs> I say, Lord, that's not fair. <laughs> anyway, maybe it'll come again. Maybe you'll have that original. But in this dream, I was singing with this beautiful voice. And you know, I'm stretching the imagination. This beautiful voice was coming out of me. It was the voice of redemption. It was the voice of this liberated captive, one that had been bound by his sin, but now had been brought into the freedom and the glorious courts of God. This heart was singing a new song in Zion. That's where God is saying to us in this hour that no matter where the captivity, if it's in Egypt or if it was in Babylon, when they were captured in Babylon, you see, they actually came out of that captivity as well, didn't they? And it said, the Lord gave them a new song. They couldn't sing in their captivity, but when they came out, they began to sing this new song. You see, that's what's going to break forth in the worship in this hour. It's going to be the song that comes out of his people. It's called the new song of the Lord. It's that spontaneous praise that lifts a new voice to the Lord that comes forth out of the sincerity of a heart that's been transformed. 
Not out of a mind or not out of a skill set, but about out of a genuineness of confirmation of thankfulness that comes out of the heart because of this great Savior that's come to liberate us from our sin and to bring us into the land flowing with milk and honey, laden down with the gold and the silver. A lot of Christians are praying, oh, God, we can't wait till the day of the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Well, get righteous. <laughs> Some people want the wealth without the righteousness. See, it's the wealth is coming, and it's already here. But the Lord doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about the gold and the silver and the money and all that stuff. All he cares about is you. You're the one he wants to capture. You're the one he wants to put the door on the, the blood on the door and eat the flesh. He, you're the one that he wants to say, come and partake and dine with me. Sup with me. I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. That's the door of the kingdom that God has set before us in this hour. Wow. Ooh, I love this identification part, don't you? Man, we could, go, we could go camping right there, couldn't we? Wow. He identified. That's the beautiful thing about Christ. He's so identified with us. It's still mind-boggling to think that there's a God that come down to the very lowest point of human existence, the very depraved lost, confused, rebellious, sinful position that man can get to at the lowest point of man's creation, that there's a God that goes down to that very place, that very pit, and finds you. Wow. How deep he went. How deep he went to find you, find me. Some of you may didn't have to go that far because you were okay, but some of us, like me, we're down there. I mean, we were buried under the refuge. I mean, the Lord even digs through the refuge. He somehow, he, the Lord's like the bloodhound of heaven. He can smell them out. He's looking at, he's like, where, well, that's all up. No, there's some more down there. Huh. I'm going to have to dig down a little further. I'm going to have to go to the very place of hell. I'm going to have to go into hell to find this one. But I'm going to bring him out. Whew, I'm going to bring him out of hell. I'm going to bring him in to heavenly places. I want to bring him into places he didn't dream he could ever walk in. That's my God. Hallelujah. One day this little Israeli is down in the pits hammering out, trying to make brick without straw, sweating, deprived of nutrients, living his last days on earth. The next day, He's being adorned and crowned with the gold and the silver of Egypt. Marching out of that land as a triumphant son. Wow. Think about it. To, to be a slave under the mighty oppression of the Egyptians was probably beyond any of our ability to even comprehend the, the great suffering that would incur. Think just in a matter of a moment of the twinkling of an eye. He was leaving town in style. Wow. Triumphant over the greatest nation on the face of the earth. That's the way the kingdom's coming. Suddenly, pow, the church will partake of the Lord in such a way that it will become the greatest transformative, transformative instrument or however you say it, transformative instrument on the planet. Didn't just bring us here as a church to say, well, well, thank God we're saved. Now he brought us here to say, thank God we're triumphant. Hallelujah. That we're establishing something new upon the earth. You see, that's what's in my heart, that I'm not just here just to relish and glory in the fact that I'm not bound to a devil's hell, but I'm here to relish and glory in the fact that I'm moving into a land that's never been taken before, that 34 nations are going to fall, that when I go to the River Jordan, 
And I come to that place and I take once again the Passover and bring the covenant into effect by bringing the circumcision to those that haven't been. And I encounter the angel of the Lord that says, I am here to lead you as captain of the Lord of hosts. And I march across that river and I march up to this Jericho. And the Lord collapses the wall in front of me. And I'm that Caleb. 40 years. Now I'm 85. And I said, I'm stronger today than the day I left Israel. Now granted, a lot of them died. Most of them died in the wilderness. But Caleb didn't. He actually got stronger. Because every day he would keep going out to the tent of meeting. He kept going out and partaking of the life. He kept drinking from the well. He kept seeking the presence. And he became stronger and stronger and stronger until it became inevitable. God couldn't hold them back anymore just because of Caleb and Joshua. Do you realize that? The Lord delivered a whole nation because those two men refused to do anything but to receive every bite of what God had given them to eat. And they became the perpetuators and the instigators of a whole new nation birthed upon the earth, the nation of Israel. Wow. We could be a Joshua and a Caleb right here. Oh, well, we're just a little church in Austin. Just a little group of people. Just a little insignificant people. Yeah, we're all lambs. But guess what? Also lions. Wow. We're all insignificant, but guess what? In him. Mm. We're going to shout, see the walls fall down. See, maybe in your life it's about time you started shouting. Let the walls start coming down. It's about, by this time, it's about time you took a Passover and you took it in such earnest that it transformed your life. Wow. Oh, I got to quit in 11 seconds. <laughs> Joking. Okay. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Shut up. Okay. How many of you ever want to tell your phone, shut that? Shut that. We can understand that the great riches of Christ are laid up for us. They're ours. They're waiting for us to appropriate. Just take the healing. It's yours. Amen. Oh, God, please help me in my weakness. Just take the strength. It's yours. You don't have to please God anything. This is your house. That he put, it's his house he put you in. God puts you in his house, so why does he want you, to, you don't have to go around begging him to get it. Just take it, it's yours. He said all things that pertain to life and godliness are now yours. Just take it, it's yours. Oh, Lord God, if I could just move in the Holy Spirit, well, move in it. It's yours. If I could just receive your wisdom, Lord You've got his wisdom. He's given you, he's imparted you with all wisdom and prudence and knowledge and understanding. It's yours. Oh, I didn't realize that it's mine. Yes, it's yours. You're more than a conqueror in all things. Thanks be to God who's given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's yours. Move in it. People say, well, we just need more healings. Well, we don't need more healings. All the healings are already here. We just need to appropriate it. We need 
more miracles. Well, the miracles are already here. Just appropriate it. I believe God. And it was accounted to me for righteousness. Woo, man. That's a shame I'm just getting wound up, but I'm going to quit. One more thing. Maybe two. The thing the Passover teaches us is that we have to begin to prepare for a new day. See, we have to begin to, un begin to think like, Lord, there is a new day coming. So I'm going to start preparing myself, positioning myself, putting myself in the place where this new day can happen to me. See, if you're, if you're retreating, withdrawing, pulling back, don't expect something new to happen in your life. But if you position yourself in the right place, the right time, it happens for you. So what's the right time? The time is up to you. The time is up to me. The time is up to us because God has already ordained it from heaven. So the moment we decide, we decide, is the moment God's decision is made for us already. Well, I don't believe I should have any responsibility in this. Shouldn't the Lord take all the responsibility? No, he did it all already. It's just now our responsibility is to enter in. Someone has to finally say, I'm going to cross the river. Some generation, someday, somewhere has to say, this is the hour the kingdom of God will come upon the earth. This is the day that the Lord has ordained for us to walk in. Someone has to believe in order to see what God has prepared for us that believe. Amen. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready for the new day. Put your staff in your hands. Gird your loins. Put your sandals on your feet and get ready for tomorrow is a new day for you. Amen? Woo. See, if the children of Israel had neglected one instruction, if they had failed in one thing that God told them to do, if they would said, well, okay, he told us to kill a lamb that was a year old, but that's okay. We love this little lamb because our kids have learned to love it and sleep with it at night like a teddy bear. We're going to kill the two-year-old lamb instead. Oh, but it's a little bit too bloody to cut the throat of this lamb and spread the blood on the doorpost, so we're going to use a, a little knife and, and cut a little, little vein here and let a little blood come out and then patch it up. Then we'll take the blood and put it over the doorpost. Oh, and it's so radical that we roast and bake this lamb that we love. So we're going to take this old 10-year-old goat and kill it. Surely God will see where our heart is at. Doesn't work that way, does it? Because if they would miss one instruction, one thing that God spoke, they would not have been delivered from the land. And a lot of Christians think they can do it the way they want to and still inherit what God has for them. A lot of Christians think they can be rebellious, that they can choose their own destiny, their own time, their own place, their own choosing, and still God will bless their socks off. Mm -mm. The Lord said, if you love me, then you will do the things that I have commanded you you to do because there is where the fountain of blessings flow now I'm not preaching legalism and I'm not going to venture to tell you what you've got to do but you know it you know the areas in your life where you've been cutting it short and slack you know you know you know the the levels of commitment where you've you've come up against the wall and you said well I'm going to back off because surely God doesn't require that much you know, I don't know for you, and you don't know for me, but we all know in our own hearts, this is the time to hear the voice of the Lord. Those that hear his voice and follow his spirit, these are the sons of God. They love not their lives. What does it say? I got to read that. Okay. 
They love not their lives unto death, but they overcame him by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. They went from victory to victory by the blood of the Lamb. We're preparing to enter in and conquer the land. Your Jerichos will fall. Everybody say it. My Jerichos, say it louder. My Jerichos will fall. Nations will bow the knee. The rain will come. The early and the latter rain. His spirit will pour out upon all flesh. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. The old men shall dream dreams. And the young men shall see visions. Milk will flow. The honey will be eaten. The great day of victory is before us. That's the Passover. Hallelujah. So let it be written. So let it be done. Amen. Let's all stand up. Stand up, give the Lord a praise offering. Isn't the Lord good?